As I invite my two esteemed panellists to join me, uh, the honourable, very honourable Peter Beattie and uh, Charles Moore, can I just come off the back of Rowan's comment before? I have a sneaking suspicion Cabinet's going to consider Stadia tomorrow and I have an awful sneaking suspicion they're going to choose to do the eastern suburbs first and the western suburbs second, but anyway, at least we'll eventually get a big new stadium. Just what everybody needs, another huge stadium at Moore Park that no one goes to. But coming up, guys, and we will... Uh, so to well, formally introduce my uh, esteemed panellists, you might know him from his new work on Sky TV and other... Uh, I, I knew him as the, as the very distinguished Premier of Queensland, the Honourable Peter Beattie AC, these days known as the man bringing you and leading the team, bringing you the Commonwealth Games in uh, next year on the Goldie, 2018. We'll hear from Peter about that. And Charles Moore, the uh, Chief Executive of the Sydney Olympic Park Authority. I think it's fair to say, um, without embarrassing Charles, a distinct change in SOPA since he took over the job. John Fay as chairman, another old Premier, um, and uh, a distinct change in engagement and commercialisation in the process. So, gentlemen, we're better to finish a day talking about um, planes, trains and automobiles in Western Sydney, about all manner of infrastructure, than the bit of infrastructure where you have a bit of fun. As Amanda said, if you don't have your health, you've got nothing. I fully agree with Amanda. And if I'm going to be unhealthy anywhere, I want to be in South West Sydney. But if, um, we also think government, the private sector, has a role not just to educate and occupy, but to recreate. Its role to help a community have fun, relax and engage. And um, we're looking at how... You, know, you might have remember we announced about six months ago that uh, we'd like the state government to consider a bid for the Commonwealth Games in 2026, 2030. I'm hoping that uh, Minister Ayres will make that positive statement sometime early next year that the government might consider going forward. They're doing their business case now. That's what we asked for, and they're doing it the right way. But we're just trying to imagine uh, the role that those major events can do in stimulating infrastructure. So I'm just going to throw a question to, to Peter Beattie. As I said, put your hands up. There hasn't been a single hand up today. We've had people text questions. I want, in this session alone, a couple of hands. We're going to rev it up. And poor Andrew Fong's held a microphone to run to all day. No one's had to take it. So uh, somebody will kick us off today with a... Oh, there you go, Mary Ann. I'll come straight to you as soon as I ask him a question. Thank you. Um, Peter, we've had a whole day talking about this massive growth in Western Sydney, the sheer numbers, the, the West Australia moving into Western Sydney to house. It wasn't long ago you presided over a state where South East Queensland was the darling of all that growth. Mm. So firstly, what do we learn from what you went through, your successes, your predecessors in managing that? That was all about Victorians driving through New South Wales and, and putting up a tent in, 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 in South East Queensland. But what, if you had your druthers, what would you do differently? What, how would you recalibrate it to meet that growth that you were undertaking at the time? Well, the first thing is that we did have a regional plan for South East Queensland, which meant we worked out where the lungs of the community we're going to be, that is open space, green space, because we needed to protect quality of life. But we also planned where schools were, highways were. We built the M1. As you know, these days people are arguing about the extension of it, but we built it because we needed to link the Gold Coast with Brisbane. But we also put a lot of money into public infrastructure uh, and also uh, into public transport. So we had a long-term strategy uh, and it was a 20-year plan for investment in infrastructure and projects. We identified them. That still exists, although what we did was take the politics out of it. That is, we got an agreement, in a sense, with what needed to be built. The problem is, of course, it means politicians couldn't announce new projects, so they really didn't cut like the, the idea. Well, cut the ribbon, because everyone knew what was planned. So that's lost a little bit of focus. But if you do, try and turn it back to Western Sydney, it really is about infrastructure, it is about, if you, if you talk about the Commonwealth Games, for example, the Commonwealth Games in the Gold Coast is the first time they've ever been held in a regional city. And what it's done, Christopher, is actually be a, a, a stimulus, if you like, for better transport outcomes, investing in a whole lot of projects like a health and knowledge precinct around the, the Olympic Village, which will be based on research. And as, as a result of the Commonwealth Games, when they're over, the Gold Coast will have more people employed in health and education than they will in tourism. That's the transformative outcome you can get from a major event. Now, I can answer a lot more particular questions, but in general summary, it is about events like the Commonwealth Games were a stimulus for investment and the strategic planning, which you otherwise wouldn't get. And what it does is bring forward investment in things like light rail, heavy rail, and also road upgrades. 
as the son of a former Minister for Sport and Tourism and a 20-year advocate for tourism and the major events industry, I'm very keen on the Commonwealth Games in Western Sydney, but I'm particularly keen on it as a way to get my metro rail quicker, to get my airport delivered as quickly as I can mm. to deliver that, and to help Charles Moore. First question to you, Charles, we'll throw to the room. You now own, you're the landlord of, uh, of Sydney Olympic Park, what most of us used to call Homebush. I grew up working in the Homebush abattoirs, so I, I still take hard to get Homebush out of my... And it's still a $5 fine. fine every time you say home. <laughs> That's killing me. Um, Olympic Park now is on the verge almost of rebirth. It's next year of success. There was probably 10 years when we let it go. We, the flame went out. We thought the job was done and it knocked around a bit. People like Paul Walker's talking about the, 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 with the um, town square with RAS have plans for the convention centre and other entertainment facilities, ANZ, which I think will get second done, but hopefully start of 2019, they'll rebuild ANZ into the best footy stadium in the world. So you've got to be pretty excited now that there is a bit of movement. What would possibly hosting a major event like Olympic Games again there do to help give the stimulus to drive that? I might just start by picking up on Peter's first point, which is about the legacy that major events leave. Mm. And... Olymp Sydney Olympic Park is a significant legacy asset because of a major event. Mm. $3 billion was spent there for the Sydney Olympic Games. And some of the legacy that, that was left from that is the 480 hectares of green space that central Western Sydney gets to enjoy. You go down to Blackstone Park on a weekend and you hardly room for the dog to run around anymore. Uh, not to mention the significant... Uh, and a range of different food on the barbecue. Oh, it smells fantastic. Um, not to mention the, the significant number of uh, legacy hard assets, all, all the venues and exhibition space. Um, and Sydney's been enjoying that for, for the last 20 years. Um, I also think it's a little unfair to say that, that, that nothing has happened. Because of the $3 billion that... that that the government invested, there's been $3 billion, over $3 billion of private sector investment in Sydney Olympic Park. The opportunity now, though, is to put the foot down on the accelerator. So, so how do you not get captured by the legacy too? Is that part, is that the flip side of the legacy of major events of a precinct that has to adapt from being just a, a major events precinct to a more um, holistic approach? Is that a difficult transition? I don't believe it is, actually. I, so I think the first thing is to recognise the, the heritage of the, of the place and, and the recognition that Sydney Olympic Park is Australia's number one, not could be, but is Australia's number one event and destination precinct already. You know, there's 50 days in the year where over, where over 30,000 people turn up to go to an event. And there is multiple days in the year where we where we host over a hundred thousand people at a multiple number of events. You know, there was uh, in footy final season. You know, we we had the the Giants got the right tie on today. Got the, had the Giants on. We had an NRL semi final on. We had a number of uh, Disney productions going on in Kudos Arena, and we had the GPS Athletics Carnival going on, all within a ten hour window. Right, so so th there's not another spot in the country that can do that. But by driving for another significant major event, such as a, a Com Games, where, again, it would be unique to be able to host them all in the single spot. Pete's dealing with some logistics around the mm -hmm. fact that, that you're all over, over the place. A few local councils want a bit of it elsewhere, but you get the majority of we'll it. We'll get the right? majority of it, right? Uh, what can we do? That will be an accelerator to then the next generation of activity. So Paul up here on stage before with GPT might encourage him to build, you know, 40 odd thousand square metres of retail space, which would significantly enhance the amenity uh, and, and pre and post game event experience, yep. as an example. Speaking of Giants, I know a Giants supporter in her own colours. So Andrew, we found you at, over here. Andrew, a microphone from Mary Ann Graham in the, oh, Catherine's got it. Over to Mary Ann in the Giants colours. Don't tell Shep what I said about the stadium at Moore Park, will you? I promise. You promise me. Uh, thanks. Um, this is actually to both the, the panellists and not you, Chris. You can rest your vocal cords for a couple of seconds. Um, 
you're talking about the legacy with these um, major pieces of, I guess you'd call them social infrastructure. How do you deal, you're talking about Com Games now, that sort of life cycle of infrastructure, and we're going through that at the moment in New South Wales, particularly in Sydney with Stadia. But in terms of keeping the life in that infrastructure, the constant sort of maintenance and renewal that's required, and in places like Western Sydney where you are continuing to have quite extensive population growth, what are some of the key factors that you have to be continually planning for? So, yes, there's new events coming through, but that sort of broader master planning of, of the life cycle of major infrastructure? Well, I think the first thing is you've got to have them properly run. And there is an organisation in Queensland called Stadium Queensland that does that for a number of the venues. Uh, and inevitably, the, when you've got a capital uh, infrastructure like a stadium, you've got to continue to invest in it. But the way to guarantee that governments will invest in it, if it's government owned, is to make certain that they are used by the community. Uh, I think Amanda was talking before a little about health involvement. I mean, frankly, one of the biggest challenges we face in Australia is obesity. And what we've focused on, because all the venues are finished, is getting the community to, to test them, to get young kids involved so there's a community ownership. Out of that, you'll get a long-term project to make certain the money set aside to renewal, invest, to make sure it's updated. Because you know, we talk a lot about, about innovation and technology. When people go to the experience of a stadium, they want to make certain that they are, they are using that event not just to sit in their bum, but to actually participate. One of the things we're doing at the Games is actually, if you're an athlete from Jamaica, for example, and you run out, you're, heaven forbid, I'm not trying to <laughs> export you overseas, but if you did, people would know what your event would be. You'd be able to see it either on the screen or access an app and, the, and they'd be able to say, this runner has won three gold medals, this is a recent forms, had an injury, blah, blah. That's what people want, particularly if they're under 40. So all those stadium has to actually change. But the other thing about it is just coming quickly to look broader, it's the use of the facilities. Of course, we want the Gold Coast to become a hub for post and season and pre-season training. But we also want a number of those venues to be used for other purposes. One of them will be used as a sound stage. It's already been used in the latest Thor movie that you saw. Um, it will continue to be used as a sound stage. The village will, will be used as this health and knowledge precinct I mentioned before. It'll interface with Griffith University and the public and private hospital there. So out of that, you'll get commercial reasons to renew because there will be companies that will develop some sort of vaccine or some medical breakthrough. They will then... Uh, expand their activities, there will be an anchor partner in it. So it's about multiple use, but it's also about making certain they're owned by the community. If you do that, then you don't have the debate where Stadia are uh, left, if you like, to deteriorate well beyond their life. They have a life, but you've got to continue to renew them because you take, I'm on the NRL commission, you look at crowds at football. I mean, one of the reasons the NRL has a challenge is because Channel 9 does it so well, people stay at home. But it's also because stadia have to actually be pleasant. You can't rip people off. You've got to make say, it's certain it's a, a, a great experience for families. You've got to make certain that they are female friendly. And the reason for that is very simple. Of all our tickets, 70% were bought by women. And women are becoming more powerful, not just in terms of every aspect of society, but financially and commercially. Any stadia or any sport that ignores <coughs> women, doesn't matter how male dominated it is, has got a short life expectancy. I know his Mrs. Heather. She's a powerful woman too, and uh, make very powerful. Awful lot of decisions in the media household. Charles, one thing um, Peter and the Com Games team are going to benefit from is the Gold Coast Light Rail, to, to, which has enabled, in a lot of ways, the the bid to happen. Um, you're sitting half the half people who want to bid on the next light rail coming into into Olympic Park and or the Metro Rail. Can we conceivably consider a more major events of that scale in Olympic Park if it's not, if it's sort of, do we have to time the arrival with the arrival of at least an Olympic Park metro station and a, maybe the light rail? So the stats are that Sydney Olympic Park has about 10 million visitors a year and we've kind of been flatlining for the last five to seven years at around that number, um, dependent on, on, on what sort of events do, do turn up. On our, on our economic modelling, which we've done in conjunction with the um, uh, Hornery Institute and some other ec economic uh, people a lot smarter than me, 
Um, light rail and metro, we estimate that we would double the visitation numbers to Sydney Olympic Park, double, um, to about 20 million people. What does that do? That means that we would certainly accelerate the master plan by some extent. So for those that are not familiar, we've just been through a revisioning exercise of how we can develop Sydney Olympic Park to take it beyond just game day, just being a spot people think that, that go to for a concert or, or a footy game. And that means that we're talking about, in round numbers, about two million square metres of gross floor area around office buildings, sh uh, shopping centre and, and a bunch of apartments. So building a vibrant and diverse community. Uh, if we bring Metro in, as I say, that would double the visitation. It would also significantly uh, increase the pace of delivery, accelerate the pace of delivery of that master plan uh, by, we think, by five years. It's a master plan that our target is to, to deliver that sort of space by 2030. Um, it would also mean, though, that we, would, we think that we can add probably another million square metres of GFA. So but to put that into economic numbers, what does that 20 million people do? What does that increase in, in the speed and pace and quantity of development do, that's about, about an extra $5 billion of construction value into the, into the economy. It's about another $1.5 billion of economic expenditure on an annual basis if you assume that each visitor is spending you know, around about 50 bucks on a visit, ticket, transport, some food, right? Think about those numbers. And that's what that steel spine that we've been talking about all day does. I love how my term steel spine's taking off. You can use it, you can use it everywhere, you don't have to source it. Just keep saying steel spine, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be very happy. Um, it's the sort of steel spine Peter had as a, as a Premier. Mate, do you see the steel spine everywhere in politics these days? I mean, major events aren't easy. They're, they're, you know, you, there's plenty of people have, have crashed on the rocks. Um, it'll take a steel spine by the state government to put its hand up and say, you know, you'll have done the world's best ever at Commonwealth Games and they've got to try and outdo you. But by the way, a little clue for you. Not, not Western Sydney, born in very Western, Western New South Wales, but you know, a lot of time in London and Blacktown growing up. So he's a bit of an inner Westie himself before he went to Queensland. Well, most good Queenslanders started south of the, the Tweed and went north. Um, do you see there's the steel spine in politics to continue to have the courage to put your hand up to fund major events? Because there's 100 cynics want to knock you off every time. No, and it's very difficult. You've got to actually prove it. And one of the things that we've done through the Commonwealth Games is actually engage the community with what we're doing every step of the way. I mean, we've finished all the venues and we've done them early, so you've got to run it effectively. But there's always a whole lot of knockers who actually don't want to support anything. It doesn't matter whether it's you know, rebuilding Homebush or sorry, Sydney Olympic Park, any of that area, or stadia, or run a major event. And the reality is you need something to be a stimulus. And those who are prepared to make that decision have got to go out and argue it. In an age of social media and 24-hour media cycle, of which I'm now part, I understand all that, but you can actually, if you've got the courage, you can go and win this. There are too many wimps in politics who actually want to see it as just an opportunity to get their face on TV without actually thinking that there's got to be a strategy to go with this. So, so put your NRL hat on. Not only are you a commissioner, there's a pretty good chance you'll be chairman um, next year as well. You're a major player. NRL is probably the major content player in what has been the most protracted political debate in the city, how to take so long, and of course, I mean, he's trying to spend $2 billion in Sporting Stadia. Um, little Birdie tells me Cabinet tomorrow will have it consider and finally make a decision. Um, is the prevailing view at Rugby League you're going to get what you want? Is there? Well, let me be diplomatic. I'm not the chairman. I'm only just a humble commissioner, and uh, humility took a while to get there. But in terms of um, where we are, I mean, these, these stadia just need to be rebuilt. And if you think about Parramatta, you think about Western Sydney, I mean, that's where people will go. They will actually go to matches, provided they've got a reasonable stadium to go to. And it's no-brainer. You, you look at the clubs that have got an enormous amount of support. You take Parramatta, for example, or, or the Panthers. I mean, they, they have got huge support bases. They love the game. They want to go to it. If you want to get them to continue to go to it, you've got to give them a stadium where they can take their families. And, you know, to go back to Marianne's question before, in my answer, you've actually got to make these family friendly. 
You've got to make it good for kids. You've got to make it important for, for women in particular. And I'm not just trying to, you know, highlight the women thing, except that I was stunned when we looked at who bought all the tickets and 70%, in fact, it was 73% of people who actually got on with a credit card who made the decision about which events to go to were made by women. And we know that because we email all the people who are involved. So you just can't ignore them anymore. So you've got to build facilities where families will go. And that was the basis of where rugby league came from. And if you engage the family, then the code's got a long-term future. So to answer the question, there's a lot of optimism that the government will make some good decisions tomorrow. I was at a lunch with the, the, uh, the Minister for Sport, and I have to say I was quite impressed with him. I thought he was actually on the ball. He knew his stuff. He was committed to what he wanted to do. Um, and I left the meeting thinking, well, I don't know a lot about New South Wales politics and I'm out of politics and have been for 10 years. I thought he was a future leader, to be frank. He knew what he was talking about, which is unusual these days. I was say, so does he and absolutely the Penrith boys. He should have every aspiration. Well, I got it right on two counts. Every anyway. aspiration. <laughs> um, speaking of leading, they want to throw us out and go and get a drink downstairs and put a bit of money back, in, back into Accor's pockets because they're going broke the fridge no time soon. Um, Charles, the, the greatest thing I think you've established yourself now as the CEO of the SOPA is capacity not to be the normal bureaucratic constraint and too diplomatic. Um, we're still sitting waiting to watch the other part of major events rather than stadia at Olympic Park is something like the RAS plans for the convention centre. We've got a convention centre here at Darling Harbour that's heaving under the demand. It's been great success, the land lease developed thing. It's just been worked so well, but New South Wales is losing that business now because it can't get into Sydney. How long do we have to wait for maybe government to, to move on a plan by the RAS to, to give Western Sydney the convention centre it needs at Olympic Park? You should have asked Mr Betts that earlier on today, hey? So we've got a, we've got a plan that's... Uh, we're just waiting a date to go through Gate 1 through infrastructure New South Wales because, absolutely, New South Wales is losing business because this bloke's built some pretty fancy new sheds nor north of the border and he's pinching some business. And the Victorians yeah. have been throwing, have and continue to do so, do a very good job at, at recognising the importance of that convention and exhibition market in terms of attracting the tourism dollar. Mm. Uh, the ICC should be the global front door uh, for Sydney in terms of the high-end fancy stuff. Uh, but, but New South Wales hasn't got good quality secondary exhibition and convention space and we're very keen to drive that through um, and as I say uh, it's up to infrastructure New South Wales and and the powers that be to, to support our business case on that one. Right. Last question, we get at the stage, you've got to do an ad for Gold Coast, what do we need to know? If we haven't bought a ticket, where do we buy a ticket? What's the mess? Well there are some tickets left, we've sold There's about a million. in the room too, even men buy tickets. Well I know that, the 30% have done really well, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. But <laughs> often the women have bought tickets for men, which means that they've been led to the right conclusion. Uh, we did put on a whole lot of uh, tickets yesterday, they are still online. We've sold about a million, there's a couple of hundred thousand to go for a range of events. We've made certain that accommodation is accessible. Look, these games are the Australian games. I mean, they are based on the Gold Coast and everyone gets excited about it. But what's happening in the games area, and this started in Sydney in 2000, there's a whole lot of gamers, if I can call that, who've got expertise in running these events. We're regarded globally as people who actually organise these things really well. And that started in Sydney. A diaspora, the Sydney 2000 diaspora stuff. Yeah. And in, in Melbourne in 2006, and we've got a lot of those people who did Melbourne as well as Sydney, and that critical mass has obviously moved to the Gold Coast, but it's a, it's a commercial event. So I would hope that you would go because you'll see the best of the best. The Brits are sending out a team that's absolutely fantastic. After they lose the Ashes, they'll want revenge at the Commonwealth Games, and uh, we know they're sending their best team. Kenya, which we were worried about, because it was, they had political troubles where they'd be thrown out of the Commonwealth, but they've got through all that. They're sending an absolutely fantastic team. You've got the Caribbean. This will be actually one of the best Commonwealth Games, not just in terms of organisation, but in terms of the quality of athletes, which is more important in that sense. People go to see the athletes. Well, they are, the Canadians are sending their best swimming team. This is going to be absolutely yeah, extraordinary in terms of competition. The final thing, Christopher, is that at home, Australian athletes tend to perform a little better in front of a home crowd. So you're going to see some stars you didn't know about. And like some of the heroes that went on to become legends, household names, you'll see them compete and win for the first time on the Gold Coast. And beach volleyball for the first time? Absolutely. I, love it. Time. I hear it's going to be the best governed Commonwealth Games of all time. So. Well, I'd have to agree with that. <laughs> 
never knock back a rap. Like, you don't get enough in politics. Take it when you can. Look, ladies and gentlemen, can I, in, in bringing the whole thing to a close, because uh, this is a room that needs a drink, um, particularly to thank take these blokes, said Peter Beattie, but, you know, one of the titans of the Australian political sector forever, and a great example of using all that political skill set, not only now the Commonwealth Games and, and my great love of life in, in the rugby league, to use that, that skill set derived in politics to take on to things beyond because we're really bad at utilising our former politicians, particularly our former leaders in this country. And here's a great example of using it, using it really well. And to Charles Moore, I, I made allusion, alluded to before, but he's the thinking person's bureaucrat now. He's coming from the private sector in a government operation, and to his credit, he's pushing the envelope everywhere. He's not afraid to speak his mind in the Bradfield um, uh, tradition. And I think we're blessed to have that, I think, today to bring together a final infrastructure argument into the bit of the fun bit of infrastructure is even better. Can I indulge him to hold one second? I just thank everybody else, um, particularly our two big partners, Transport for New South Wales, and um, to have Tim Reid and today say they're going to continue to do it's even, even better, and to the great people at Lend Lease who've come together with us to deliver this in a way that's given us a great day, rich content, good exchange, a bit of entertainment, uh, I think it's been tremendous. And I particularly want to thank my team, as always, uh, Brett and Catherine. Where's Brett? Hand yeah, up, Brett. Where is he at the back there? Brett Towles, former Australian schoolboys rugby union player, but he's, he's kicked on. Um, and uh, Catherine Nguyen, who works with him, part of our huge two-person events team, um, and all the rest of the guys in the office who've got him behind to help today. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it greatly for the team. Thank you, everybody, for your help.